welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Nora Slonimsky, Gardner Assistant Professor of History at Iona College. We will discuss her draft article, Oil, Elephant Bones, and an Act of Parliament, Mapping America's Earliest Copyright Claim. So welcome to the show, Nora. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. I'm really glad uh, to be here. <laughs> it was a pleasure. And you know, I forget exactly who recommended your work to me, but I'm really glad they did because I thought this article was just fascinating and I hadn't heard this story before. So I was really excited to read it and learn more about like sort of how people conceptualized copyright in colonial and early America. Yes, well, you know, so it was it was V. Rosen, right, who I, who looms very large um, in in I would say early copyright history, right? His 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 research and his work into what I would describe as sort of foundational statutory copyright history has been incredibly influential and and helpful for me. So I'm really glad he put me in touch with you, because um, again, very excited to be here, and of course, love the opportunity to talk about about legal history in its multiple forms. But this article, right, the oil elephant bones and an act of parliament, it's a really funny story. How I I in fact kind of stumbled onto the map, um, a general map of the middle British colonies in America. Which is the is the subject or the the text that that I really look at in the essay, and it was pretty much by accident, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. I, I was working uh, on finishing up my dissertation, and I must have looked at this map along with many others. I'm a, I'm a historian. I'm an early Americanist, right? So I was doing my dissertation on the early history of copyright and and what bearing copyright had on the development of of political economy in 18th century America and early 19th century America. And I noticed in the bottom right-hand corner of a general map that there was a copyright declaration. And I was like, huh. And so, you know, I, I quickly, I, I went to primary sources on copyright and the stationer's company online and sort of, you know, other well, you know, I think well-known in copyright circles, uh, resources. And I was like, this map was made in 1755. That doesn't make any sense that that would be there. Um, and so I, I checked it out at the library company in Philadelphia. I looked at it at the Society of Cincinnati in Washington, DC, uh, the Huntington Library in Pasadena. And you know it's, it's there in all the issues, it's there in the print run, it's there in the plates that made the map. And I began to get, uh, well, first of all, let me reiterate, I was confused. I was like, why is there a copyright declaration saying published by an act of parliament in in London and in Philadelphia, when there is no copyright in Philadelphia in 1755, and right, and published by an act of parliament is the copyright declaration for for Britain in the 18th century. So uh, that that noticing that that statement, that declaration, kind of brought me down or put me down on the path of looking into the experiences of Lewis Evans and how he came to interpret having uh, literary property ownership over over this map that he had made. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I mean, Nora, maybe you could talk a little bit about just why it's so weird that there was a copyright declaration on this map. I mean, what did copyright look like at that period of, in that period of time? And specifically sort of what was the difference between kind of the availability of copyright protection in England as opposed to the availability of copyright protection or or lack thereof, I guess, in the United States? That's a great point. I, I teach a class at Iona called From Hamilton to Mickey Mouse. And it's on the, it's on the relationship between intellectual property and innovation. Uh, and the one thing that consistently I see my students sort of baffled by every semester that we that we uh, work together in this class is that that the idea that there is sort of a world where intellectual property just isn't a thing, right? For people who have grown up in in the past couple of decades, right, in, in the world of, of of Disney and other sort of extensive um, copyright regimes, right? It's hard to imagine that they're they're just simply that one just didn't exist. That the very notion of 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 intellectual property, or specifically literary property, which would have been a common law or inherent 
natural right to to the output of your labor, the expression that an individual writer created, uh, that 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 right wasn't even guaranteed or understood as as being sort of a sure thing. Um, is, is always consistently surprising, and it's, and it's really interesting to, to have that conversation with them. The first Copyright Act or modern copyright regime is the Statute of Anne in 1710, and that's put into place, and there, you know, there's been wonderful scholarship from people like Mark Rose, um, Bruce Bugby has his foundational book, um, Oren Bracca and others who have looked at, at, looked at the Statute of Anne in fairly extensive detail, but in effect, it applies a limited, so 14 year term that a writer could have a copyright for 14 years to reprint or to make copies of a book that they wrote. And this was a, an, a law that was really advocated by a group called the Stationers Company, the Stationers Guild, and who was a guild of printers. So very quickly, uh, those same printers would buy up those copyrights and, and in effect, printers would really be the ones who who had the copyright protection rather than writers. Uh, the Statute of Anne was not without its controversies, right, of where it applied. Did it apply to Scotland? Did it apply only to English soil? And this is in some respects what I'm really interested in, which is where copyright both fits into and is an active site for or participator, um, participant, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, in, in those bigger questions about sovereignty and bigger questions about uh, state formation and what different government authorities can can control or can't control. Uh, what seemed to be pretty pretty understood, however, uh, was that copyright did not apply to the British North American colonies. In other words, Lewis Evans, who was a a emigrant, he moved from Wales to Philadelphia in the mid 18th century. And he was a British subject, but he resided in in uh, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, and so because he lived there, he couldn't have a a copyright in London that would apply to his his work in Philadelphia. So, in other words, and he and he writes as much. He writes as much of this, I think, his correspondence with a a very famous London publisher, Robert Dodsley. Uh, so we know that there was a general understanding amongst, at least from Evans's point of view, and Evans was someone who was very tapped into the Philadelphia, uh, what I would describe as sort of intellectual community, scientists, writers, philosophers, um, other forms of inventors, map makers, geographers. Uh, and that seemed to be the consensus that he was relaying, that if a map was made in America, it was not eligible for a British copyright. So that's really the, the the lay of the land in terms of, of how copyright was understood within these strong sort of geographic borders that dictated a lot of legal culture. And in some respects was a major driving course of, of the American Revolution itself. Just to be clear, I can't make the claim that copyright caused the American Revolution as much as I would like to, uh, but it definitely is indicative in a very early period in the 1750s of, of what control the British Empire has over uh, colonial authority or colonial um, law and practice. Right. So if I understand correctly, then what was so surprising to you about this legend on the map was that it was making a claim that was legally not available to the creator or the publisher of the map in question. Absolutely. That was what was so wild about it is it mirrored the language of what a text made in England or a text made on English soil would say, right? published according to an act of parliament, which is very much the 18th century equivalent of when we see the sea in a circle today, right? Same idea, conveys the same meaning. And yet the law does not allow for a map made in Philadelphia, produced in Philadelphia, researched in on American soil to to make that legal claim, and yet Evans does it, and he does it. Um, he's not just fully. How how should I put this? He's not just fully making it up. Um, he's very specific and precise that this is both in Philadelphia and in London. So in other words, there is one copyright sphere 
for Philadelphia. And there is another copyright sphere or intellectual property sphere, if you will, for England. And he, in his correspondence with his, his, who he's hoping will become his, his London publisher and his London printer, he says that you should make another copy of this in England so it can be eligible for copyright there. Uh, he seems to interpret the Pennsylvania Assembly, the local Pennsylvania government, as as giving him a copyright, as that that a that the Pennsylvania local government has the right to 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 grant writers uh, copy rights or copy dash rights as he, as he would refer to them, uh, because the Pennsylvania Assembly in effect endorses his map making. We have the assembly records in Pennsylvania where Lewis Evans petitions the assembly for money um, to help him finish the map. And, and to recognize the labor and the work that has gone into the map, which the assembly does in rather sort of glowing, extensive terms. Evan seems to take this endorsement and this money from the Pennsylvania assembly and in effect equate it as a copyright. So he sees himself as having a copyright in Philly and then he's aspiring to have a copyright in Pennsylvania. And then the third component that's also worth noting, right, is I think he's also hoping this is a scare tactic. I think he's hoping that people are going to see it and see the the copyright declaration in the bottom right hand corner, and it's going to scare off pirates. Uh, whether or not, right, he has the legal right to put that declaration there, he seems to think that he does because he's he's recognizing these two different um, sovereign sort of legal cultures. Uh, but the third factor is also the, the see, I, I, I've done this, you know, stay away, don't pirate, don't pirate my map or I can, or I can come for you. How he would come for this person, I have no idea, but he <laughs> seems to believe that it's going to um, create that, that warning sign, send off warning bells. Mm. Well, is the idea that the Pennsylvania legislature could grant Evans a copyright? consistent with the English conception of the sovereignty or lack thereof of the body in question? Um, let me just, so if may, to make sure I, I, I fully understand the question. In other words, does the British, does almost does British parliament think that he's right? Yeah, or exactly. Is, okay. <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay. So I, there's a lot of sports analogies I could make, right? But they don't perhaps do it justice. And I just, as a Yankee fan, uh, <laughs> uh, the British Empire is paying no attention uh, to to what uh, to what Lewis Evans is. Well, I shouldn't say that. Actually, I shouldn't be that that dismissive. Um, Lewis Evans is a, as I mentioned before, right? Is a is a certainly is a successful player in. Uh, colonial North American uh, political culture, and and the British Empire or imperial officials certainly know who he is, and in fact he he is the is the right hand man or, or the foot soldier in some respects of of several of of those British imperial figures. Someone like um, Thomas Pownall, for example, who is Evans's patron in many respects. And in, in no small part, his loyalty or Evans's loyalty to Pownall is what's going to land him in a fair amount of, of legal trouble less than a year after a general map uh, is published. A general map is also wildly successful. It's extremely popular. It's one of the most pirated images of the second half of the 18th century. Uh, it is extremely, extremely popular. For, for a variety of reasons. It's a map that is made in America, unlike um, other really famous uh, maps of the time, which are assembled in, in England and assembled out of British Imperial archive records. Uh, it's made by someone who identifies very strongly with, with Philadelphia and with Pennsylvania and with sort of American identity, which is still a nascent thing, right? It's, 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 it's in its very early stages, the very notion of being American, right, is, is still very early at this point. But Evans is, is definitely one of those people who's articulating those very early ideas about being American for all the fact that he is a, is a 
you know, good child of empire, right? He does support the British Empire. He thinks the British Empire is is the the you know is 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 the best thing to be pursuing. It's much better than the French, you know, and it's much better than than Spanish and and so on and so forth. This is also a map that has a lot of claims to authenticity, despite obviously certain historical inaccuracies. Uh, if you if you take a look at the map, you can see that Philadelphia is about ten times larger <laughs> than it actually is, uh, which is maybe sort of the, the bias towards his hometown. But this map is also something that relies very very heavily on indigenous knowledge, on on collaboration with indigenous experts. Uh, the title itself of, of my essay comes from that. This map is one of the first, I believe is the first known record of petroleum in the United States. And that is knowledge that could only have been shared with Evans by indigenous people, as well as markings of elephant bones, other natural resources. And um, Evans does state that he relies fairly heavily on um, a particular native person, but other native peoples as well in their sharing of, of information with him. So all of these factors taken together, right, this site of collaboration where it's made means that there are certainly British officials in, in London who are taking note of it. So he's not totally obscure and the, the British government is not completely ignoring his existence by any means. Whether or not the British parliament or parliament itself um, would involve itself in in any kinds of literary property claims that Evans is making, I have seen no evidence that that ever happened. And my instinct is that it probably wouldn't. Um, for all of the fact that the that Evans was really pushing to establish the principle here that he he could have literary property claims in both Philadelphia and in England, uh, there was very little you were going to be able to do to stop piracy in this period, right? Piracy is is the culture and, and trade courtesy as as a sort of extra legal practice is not something that's, I would say, fully fleshed out. Um, that being said, the the more likely group who who would have, and, and the stationer's company, it's worth noting, is not sort of a government entity, but it's heavily bound together with, with British um, parliamentary support and politics. So it's, it's, definitely sort of an official organization. If they were gonna get into any trouble or have any issues, those issues would have come from the stationer's company. And the reason why there doesn't seem to be any issues, and, and I wanna also give a really, you know, uh, a great shout out here to Ian Gadd for, for his uh, advice as I've gone through the stationer's records, is that the people who said they were gonna help Evans, the people who said they were gonna register the map, a British edition of the map with the stationer's company, never followed through. Uh, his publisher didn't, and his friend Thomas Pownell didn't, likely because Evans uh, died, because Evans died um, of an illness that he contracted while he was incarcerated in New York in 1756. So by June, again, by a year, June of 1756, Evans was, was gone. So what the stationer's company might have pursued or action they might have taken it just never came to pass, which is what uh, the, the tragedy of sort of Evans's death also makes the story in some ways half, uh, never really finished. So we don't really know how other government entities, or I would say the stationer's company specifically would have reacted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess one thing that really struck me, so like based on your article, I understood Evans essentially to be taking the sponsorship of the Pennsylvania legislature of his map as sort of a valuable work as an implicit kind of promise or grant of some form of literary property or copyright protection in in the map. And, and, and I guess I wonder, like, would that assumption have been provocative in any way, do you think, to Parliament and its concept of the sovereignty of the colonial governments? In other words, it, you know, for example, if the Pennsylvania legislature had said, we're going to create our own version of the Statute of Anne and start creating Pennsylvania yeah. copyrights, would Parliament have been cool with that? Or, you know, even if they tried to do that in sort of a more kind of ad hoc sort of 
case by case, case by case or common law fashion, would that have been consistent with Parliament's understanding of what the Pennsylvania legislature was allowed to do? That's it, that, and that, in some respects, is is sort of the heart of what I'm trying to to uh, evaluate and look into in my in my larger book project. Um, my my short answer is uh, yes, they would have had a problem with it, and. And my longer answer is is more why they would have had a problem with it, and because it's a clear encroachment on on parliamentary prerogative, right? Uh, it's if we look at at literary property as I think connected to several several issues that are deeply entrenched in in the road to American independence. And particularly if we if we recognize that American independence was not some sort of inevitability, right? The American Revolution was not preordained. The the central driving issue that I see connecting what's at stake in intellectual property and what's at stake with these bigger questions about sovereignty is really predicated on well, really on two things. The first is 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 that recognition of sort of self ownership, right? That a and we're of course talking about this in 18th century intellectual property, right? Not 21st. There, there's there's clearly a huge evolutionary difference, of course, you know, over the course of centuries. But if the premise that the colonies are are pushing for is, do we have how much self government are we allowed to have? And if we don't ha- are not allowed to have X amount of self government, then can we participate? in parliamentary government? Can we participate in our governance across the Atlantic? Literary property on the one hand is it is very much bound to that issue of do I own the do I own my labor, right? Do I own the expression of my labor? Copyright though is a statutory agreement. It's a statutory right for a limited amount of time that parliament has chosen to grant to subjects. And it's not that different than, than lots of other statutes or laws that parliament passes for British subjects living in England that vest subjects with certain rights and privileges that the colonists do not believe they are getting. So in that sense, the Pennsylvania Assembly, recognizing the labor of Lewis Evans, probably would not set off that many alarm bells for them because, okay, he's making a colonial map for colonists. Uh, then, then so be it. And yet, because what Lewis Evans is, of course, doing is is never so simple, right? Maps in the 18th century are never that simple. They're not that simple today, for that matter, right? You are you are quite literally. It's not it's not even a me- it's not metaphorically, but but literally, you are depicting hotly contested territorial boundaries and extremely fraught sites of which imperial power believes it has a claim. Um, how are you going to recognize indigenous sovereignty and indigenous nations in those conversations? Are you going to recognize them or not? Uh, and so on and so forth, right? As well as intercolonial disputes and tensions, you know, what belongs to Maryland? What belongs to Pennsylvania? So the, the site of the, the literary property itself, I think, would also be perhaps why, why Parliament could take issue with what the Pennsylvania government did, which was to give sort of a, a explicit recognition. The reason why I think, again, it doesn't really come to pass and create that many other issues is simply because parliament is looking at so many different things and this flies relatively under the radar. If they were going to try and pass a formal literary property law in Pennsylvania in 1756, 1755, I think that would have attracted attention. And the only other reference we really can rely on to say that is when in Massachusetts, 20 years later, about 20 years later, um, there is an attempt to vest a, he refers to it as intermittently a privilege, um, occasionally a patent, but basically what William Billings, who was a musician, is asking the Massachusetts government for is a copyright for his New England Psalm Singer, for his book of songs. And the the Massachusetts government gives it to him and then considers the idea of turning this into a more comprehensive bill, meaning people could either apply for it on a more regular basis. It is still a specialized bill for billings, bill for billings, say that really fast three times. Uh, 
but but there there in the in the supporting documents there there are references to the possibility that you know maybe there there would be some kind of law. However, Thomas Hutchinson, the governor, puts the kibosh on it right away. He rejects Evans, excuse me, Billings's claim for a copyright uh, right away. He says no. And we don't know why. We don't have, he didn't unfortunately leave us an explanation as to why. Uh, and of course, the situation in the early 1770s is, is much more fraught in terms of imperial colonial relationships than it is in the 1750s. But I think that is reflective really of your question, right? That would they have a problem with colonies attempting in some form or another to build up sort of an ad hoc or more consistent copyright regime. And I, I think the answer is they, they would not be very happy about it because when they came town to it in the 1770s, they said no. And that is also undoubtedly tied to the fact that copyrights are tied to material expression. Um, we're talking about sort of an era of the Stamp Act and regulation of print and regulation of media. And, you know, obviously intellectual property and, and, and freedom of expression, uh, there's lots of historical examples where they are um, intention. And yet in this example, and in this instance, it seems like the understanding is that uh, to give a copy, <laughs> to give a copyright actually helps freedom of expression. Um, in this instance, uh, not of course in, in others, but that there seems to be this sort of conflation of, of what Hutchinson does in that later episode of, no, we will not give you a copyright because copyright will encourage you to print more books. And we don't want, we don't want you um, printing more books that might have at all seditious or for that matter, simply critical um, content. Evans's map, right, in 1755, um, Took, took a political stance. It took a political um, position. And if you did not agree with that political position, then you could consider his map libelous or you, which is again, it's worth noting that Evans, again, died because of his incarceration on charges of libel, um, that he was libeling uh, rival political factions to Thomas Pownall. So yes, I, 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 will, I will stop there, but I think there is a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, complex dynamic, let's say, between how much autonomy the British Empire really wanted localized legal regimes to have when it came to early, early, we can even say proto forms of literary property. Well, so what happened then with Evans's kind of bold attempt to make a copyright claim. I mean, you mentioned that the map was heavily pirated. Did he ever try to do anything about that himself? And what about his heirs? Because I understand that he, you know, he died not long after the publication of the map. So the again, it's it's really in some ways his his first attempt, and I like how you put it, sort of his bold attempt, because it, it was very bold what he was trying to do. I think it's safe to say it was not successful. Um, uh, again, Evans, shortly after the map's publication, Evans finds himself in political hot water um, and he, he's accused of libel and he is incarcerated and held without trial and without bail in a New York prison in New York City. And while he is incarcerated, as I mentioned before, he becomes extremely ill and he's released and two days after his release, he dies. Um, and on his deathbed, uh, he entrusts the copyright of a general map to his only surviving child, Amelia Evans, who goes on to become Amelia Evans Barry. And Amelia Evans is a fascinating, fascinating person in her own right, and someone who was acutely aware of her father's early efforts to gain a copyright around a general map. Uh, Amelia is raised first by her, her uncle in Philadelphia. Her godmother it, was Deborah Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's wife. And so she grew up um, in really close proximity to the Franklins. And, and, and Franklin was certainly um, someone she remained close with for the rest of her life and the rest of his life. And Franklin seemed to care about her fairly deeply. Um, 
Uh, upon the death of her uncle, she moved to England. It appears she moved to go to go live with another family member there in England. She never returns to the United States. But before she goes, she what appears to she sells the copper plates to Benjamin Franklin. She sells the plates to Franklin, and with the understanding that she retains the copyright, um, and that he will look after the plates for her. Uh, when, you know, if and when she's, she's either able to sell them or to pursue something else, so sort of some other possible revenue streams with them. She, she moves to England. She becomes a governess. And, you know, over the course of her correspondence with Franklin, the, the state of the plates and the map are a recurring conversation. So she never forgets that the map and the copyright to the map is something that she could be pursuing, but she's got limited ability to do much with it. Uh, Thomas Pownall was this was entrusted by Evans to pursue an English edition of the map and to basically obtain a copyright for an English edition of the map. Pownall fails to do so until about 20 years later. So when Franklin goes to London for his long sort of stay in England, uh, he brings the plates with him, and he gives those plates to Thomas Pownall. Then Pownall decides to create a, a updated version of the map that uh, he says the proceeds will be donated to Amelia Evans sort of out of respect for both her father's work and, and in recognition of this, this copyright that Evans had entrusted to Amelia. Uh, the map, he also writes some pretty fiery accompanying essays where he points out um, in no in no uncertain terms that all the people who had pirated Evans's map since the first edition came out um, were, were terrible people and he had very strong words for them. Um, but at the same time, he also failed to, to get a copyright for the map anyway. Uh, but so this, this re-released edition I would say is the culmination of the story because it does it does get a it is an official English edition that Evans had been sort of pursuing before his death and it does recognize a proprietary um, claim or an inheritable proprietary claim that Amelia Evans has over it. Of course, this is all outside of courtrooms, right? This is all extra legal. But it is a really fascinating example of legal cult, what I would describe as sort of um, a transatlantic legal culture, in which the terminology of of literary property, of of labor, of of again of copy dash right of of these other these other let's say sort of rhetoric that surrounds intellectual property law, is being played out in in the sphere of public opinion, and and being acted upon in these extra legal, you know, informal spaces. Mm. Well, Sonora, in closing, I understand that this essay or this, this article is going to eventually be incorporated into a larger book project. So, I mean, I wonder if you could talk briefly about what you envision the sort of thesis or goal of the book project to be and how this article will fit into it. Sure. Uh, thanks for the chance to talk about it. This is good for me to, to to share some of these ideas as I work through them myself. Uh, so my my book project is under contract with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, it's going to be published when it's done eventually uh, in the the Early American Studies Center. Excuse me, series from the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, which is also at Penn. And the book, the working title is called "The Engine of Free Expression." copywriting the state in early America. And this chapter or this essay that I shared with you will likely be um, parts of the second and third chapter of the, of the book. So I, I begin the story with a, a sort of a general sort of understanding of, of where literary property is in the early 18th century. Um, and then I connect it to a, a, broader conversation about autonomy, uh, specifically political autonomy, and how much of the language surrounding land ownership and dominion and 
and the sort of building of political power and government power um, is really reaffirmed in many forms of, of literary expression in the 18th century. So in a nutshell, and, and I owe a tremendous debt to really wonderful, um, I- incredible scholarship um, in, in, in copyright studies and early American studies. So there's so many names to think of, but, you know, uh, again, as I mentioned, sort of Oren Bracca's work, Molly Hardy, uh, Meredith McGill, uh, Melissa Homestead, um, Bob Spoo, uh, the, the list could just go on and on. Zvi has been wonderful. Uh, you know, there's really, there's really, really fascinating work that that looks at sort of copyright either in the 18th century, copyright in England, um, an absence of copyright, really. I'm, I'm kind of looking, I'm kind of flipping it a little bit. I'm looking at how very early attempts at at instituting forms of copyright activity or forms of copyright claims were deeply tied to the process of state formation. And even though many of the episodes I look at are, are not successful examples of, of copyright, right? They're not, they're not examples where people um, make a lot of money or, or are really um, all that capable of stopping um, sort of unlicensed or unregulated reproductions of their work. But I begin the 1730s and the 1740s, and I go through We and V. Peters in 1834. And while some of the episodes I look at are are legal cases, I I certainly have some of them, many of the episodes, and I would say the majority are not, I'm looking at really extra legal uh, interactions from people like Lewis Evans, Thomas Hutchins, um, Jedediah Morse, Webster appears, and Francis Hargrave is a legal example, but there's there's a lot of cast of characters here. Um, I look at at women printers like Elizabeth Holt, um, uh, different examples of where writers are engaging with concepts of literary property in order to both articulate sort of a self-ownership and self-autonomy, meaning an individual experience of, of owning their work, but also how they, and in their work with government and government capacities, see their literary property claims and the expression contained in the work that they're doing as actively helping in a state building process. In the colonial era, this is a sort of a colonial state building process, building a, a sphere of influence that is separate from the British Empire, and then after independence, this is going to develop in cases of creating or supporting the creation of a more expansive version of federalism. Mm. Well, it sounds fascinating, and I honestly can't wait to read the book. So, oh, thank you, Nora. Thanks so much for coming on the show to talk about this excellent paper. Uh, I look forward to seeing the final version when it comes out, and we'll share a link as soon as it's available with, with listeners. And um, I I hope I can have you back on to talk about the book when it's ready to go. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. There'll be no detours in heaven 
the road now. My last stop is heaven some sweet day. Destruction For God Was there to see them through There'll be No detours in heaven No Rough roads along 